Welcome to Historically Speaking. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer. And before we begin our new episode, we're going to have a feedback loop from last month's show. My guest was Rich Elnicki as we talked about collecting postcards. And the mystery card was this one. And as we were discussing this, at the time, we just couldn't figure this out. And rather imaginatively, we thought it might have been a train wreck with falling trees. And right after the show, our production manager brought it to our attention that the card needed to be flipped around. So now you can see it with its proper orientation, which shows a, a camp uh, on a lake with steps down into the water, uh, the trees leaning to the left. And lest we think we were totally missed the boat, no pun intended, um, on this one, the orientation of the card was um, landscape, but the actual photograph was portrait. So as always, if any of our readers have feedback for us or we have committed a small faux pas as we did in this last episode, uh, we would always be happy to include a feedback loop at the start of our new show. Our episode this time is Warren G. Harding's Last Summer. As Vermont approaches the centennial of the storybook inauguration of Calvin Coolidge in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, where he was vacationing, before we review all of that with everything to do with Calvin Coolidge, we need to know who his predecessor was, Warren Gamaliel Harding. Now, as presidents of the United States are concerned, Warren G. Harding, uh, over the last 90 years, has had a very low reputation among American historians. That was not always the case. And before delving into his personal story, I have to tell you uh, I have had a long-standing love of studying presidents of the United States. When I was in sixth grade, this series of books was on sale at the A&P. With $10 worth of groceries, you could get this book for $1.99. The American Heritage Book of Presidents of the United States. I read them all. Uh, I love them. And, and with the various books that have come and gone out of my home, I always have a place of prominence on my shelves for these books. And one day when I had one of the volumes on the bus going home, a friend of mine said to me, I'll bet that tomorrow, by tomorrow, I'll bet you 25 cents that you can't name all the presidents in order. Well, there was a lot more space on the hard drive 50 plus years ago, I won the quarter bet. And it's one of those parlor games I can still do. I know my presidents backwards and forwards. Warren Gamaliel Harding was the 29th president of the United States. He was born at the end of the Civil War in Blooming Grove, Ohio. He grew up in very comfortable circumstances. He married uh, a woman who claimed to have been a divorcee, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, um, when he was 26 years old. And to my surprise, he was only 57 years old at the time of his death. Prior to becoming president of the United States, he was a newspaper editor and owner in his hometown of Marion, Ohio. He had been elected to the Ohio Senate served as lieutenant governor, and had a six-year term in the United States Senate beginning in 1914. Here are some images of Harding uh, at left at 21 and at 35. And maybe it's just the formality of poses, but to me, Harding at 35 years old looks a lot more than 35. And then what many consider to be 
his presidential portrait when he was 55 years old. A little bit about Harding's wife, who was definitely the power behind the throne. Her nickname was the Duchess. And as her biography was spun out during campaign years, it was alleged that she was a divorcee who had a young son named Billy DeWolf. Mr. DeWolf disappeared from the picture, and Billy was raised as Harding's stepson. Later biographers have discovered that this was a fiction. In fact, Florence had a child, but out of wedlock. And doing my own original research on this, here is a copy of Warren Harding's marriage license to Florence Kling, no DeWolf, and you can see that both are listed as having no prior marriages. This is a picture of Harding Senate office taken in 1914. You can already see the elements of modernity here with the telephone on his desk. Harding is among the rare presidents who had at least one parent living at the time of his inauguration. So in this family picture, we have Mrs. Harding, uh, the president-elect, and his father, Dr. George Harding. Dr. Harding outlived his son by five years. He was then on his third wife. So the election of 1920. In order to understand the popularity of Harding in the context of his own time, we need to understand what the larger national dynamic was in 1920. Woodrow Wilson had served two terms as the Democratic President of the United States. He reluctantly entered the war, World War I, in April of 1917, having run in the election of 1916 on a keeping out of war platform. The United States uh, had heavy casualties in World War I. Uh, many soldiers came back uh, wounded, maimed, psychologically scarred. And even though I had an understanding of the casualty count of World War I and all the years that I taught it, it's really with time that I have come to more fully appreciate the psychological impact of war and the long-standing consequences it would have had on the civilian population. Woodrow Wilson campaigned unsuccessfully for the United States to join the League of Nations in the process of that exhaustive campaign. Uh, he had a paralyzing stroke, largely kept from the public at that time. And Harding, who was kind of crafted by the Republican National Party, ran on a ticket of a return to normalcy. And his campaign slogan had a uh, resounding depth among the American public. And among the many pieces of campaign ephemera that we can see, here is a piece of sheet music, Harding, You're the Man for Us. And of course, something that we will develop further in our next program was his running mate was the governor of Massachusetts, Calvin Coolidge. Harding and Coolidge ran against James Cox and the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This election is interesting also because it was the first election following the ratification of the 19th Amendment in which women could vote. So I love this campaign uh, slogan here, uh, women, for your own good, vote the Republican ticket. And here we have some editorial opinions of how the mothers of America are rallying not to have their sons fight in another international war. Here is another very bold postcard campaign, uh, a campaign image of Calvin Coolidge at left, 
law and order. He is the person that intervened in the Boston police strike of 1919 and said, I may not be quoting this exactly, but the police never have a right to strike at any time. And we have Harding with his caption of America first. And I will say more about that in a moment. In this picture, we see the candidates under the shadow of Lincoln. And here we have the quote from the Gettysburg Address, that the government of the people shall not perish from the earth. And we have an image here, a rather ghostly image of Abraham Lincoln uh, passing the mantle to his chosen successors. Curiously, remember Lincoln died in 1865, some months before Warren G. Harding was born. I need to give a nod to the other candidates here, um, James Cox, who remains kind of a footnote to history as having lost to Harding. And the interesting thing about the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt here, he was only 38 years old, and these are among the last public pictures of Roosevelt walking because the next summer, the summer of 1921, FDR contracted polio, which left him paralyzed from the waist down. One of the campaign songs that was written uh, for Harding in 1920. I'll read the lyrics here because it tells you something about the motivations at the time. Have you heard the new byword? Absolutely. Don't you think it is a bird? Absolutely. Will Warren Harding be elected? The Lee Covenant rejected and the White House disinfected, absolutely. And then the refrain, absolutely, absolutely, you all know what it means, so please remember that your votes for Warren G will ensure absolutely that America will be free after November. And then in the second verse, we have an allusion, I won't read it all, Jimmy Cox will be undone, absolutely, profiteers on the run, and what that is an allusion to, the anti-war platform alleged that America's involvement in World War I directly benefited uh, munitions manufacturers. Harding ran a very unique political campaign in 1920. It was called the Front Porch Campaign, and it was just that because instead of traveling throughout the country, the country came to him. And with the benefit of newspaper coverage and newsreels, Harding simply stood on his front porch and preached his campaign slogan. We have here a uh, quartet of the president and uh, Mrs. Harding with Vice President and Mrs. Mrs. Coolidge uh, when they were at Union Station in Washington, D.C. And although uh, the top coats uh, are really unchanged with time for men, we can see in this image how much women's fashions have changed over a century. More uh, publicity photos here of Harding and his wife Florence. And you can see that these were taken probably on the same day from Florence's uh, dress. And one of the things that we certainly know is that Mrs. Harding in many ways pushed her husband, pushed him into politics, and really, as I alluded to earlier, was the force uh, behind him seeking the presidency of the United States. In these images, we can see how photographs are retouched uh, and uh, redoctored. So at left, we see an image that was taken probably informally in Harding's garden with his house in the background. And then what the photographer did is that he whited out 
the extraneous background uh, and uh, made it into what would become a campaign image for Harding. We now have a 1920 news reel of which, which actually would have been shown in theaters of Harding's campaign bid in 1920. And of course, this is a silent From the film. Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Even without sound, you can see from these images how so many people took to Harding because they felt he looked like a president, he looked like a statesman. It's really wonderful when we have the opportunity to see history come alive. And even though this is over a century ago, we are fully into a media age. And although television transmission was in its infancy, the Harding campaign used media that was available. And certainly we can see that through the newsreel. So why is it that Warren G. Harding, who was elected with a great deal of popularity, why is it that later historians seem to have turned against him? And the answer is partially in his cabinet choices. So here we have an image of Harding's cabinet and his Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, would resign during Harding's presidency. His attorney general, Harry Doherty, would be brought up later on various criminal charges of corruption. But we also, to be fair with our historical assessment, in addition to choosing Calvin Coolidge as his vice presidential running mate, Coolidge certainly was a man of upright moral probity. And there were also some other uh, really great statesmen who were part of Warren G. Harding's cabinet. So at left, we have Andrew Mellon, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, Herbert Hoover, who was the Secretary of Agriculture and Charles Evans Hughes, who was the Secretary of State. If Herbert Hoover had not become the President of the United States um, in 1929, 
history would have had a kinder verdict for him for all the work that he did with relief efforts following World War I. And Charles Evans Hughes would be later appointed as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But what began to happen in the spring of 1923 is that the appointees who were Warren Harding's cronies from his buddies in Ohio, the seeds of corruption began to ferment. So in February, there was one um, suicide of a member of Harding's circle who felt that the criminal charges were um, catching up to him. Another member of Harding's circle was either murdered uh, or committed suicide. And in April of 1923, the Wall Street Journal broke a story about corruption with the sale of United States oil reserves in Teapot Dome. And this would be something that would largely come to light after Harding's death and the rife corruption within his personal circle is something that Harding did not see in his lifetime, or the public did not know it, but this began to weigh heavily on the president. So what he decided to do uh, with things heating up in Washington, quite literally, he undertook a national tour. So we see him here um, disembarking from a ship in Vancouver. At left, he is at the back of a train in San Francisco. And it would be in San Francisco where he died uh, very, very suddenly from a complication of pneumonia, stomach poisoning, um, etc. And probably the, um, the contributing factor with all of this was stress. One of the things that uh, I found here is there was a very adulatory life of Warren Harding that was written within months of his death. This is in the public domain. And just to get a flavor of Harding's popularity uh, in his lifetime, immediately after his lifetime, I would like to read just a little bit about this first paragraph called A Nation Shocked. San Francisco, a place of rejoicing turned into a city of mourning. News of the death of the president comes with almost electric suddenness, a nation in sorrow. Neighbor, I want to be helpful. This was the keynote of President Harding's life. And when the news of his sudden death in San Francisco was flashed across the country on the night of August 2nd, 1923, the people felt that they had not only lost a president, but a great hearted neighbor. In his two years and five months in office, he had endeared himself to every class. Men differed with him politically, but all paid him tribute, is one of the most lovable figures in American history. And oh my, how things can change with historical judgment. And once again here throughout this biography, uh, which was written in glowing terms, we have an image here that is showing Harding returning from church services along with this summary paragraph. For him thus tragically, in the twinkling of an eye, to be snatched away, his tasks apparently undone, leaving the world without his stabilizing leadership, seemed a direct loss amounting to disaster to a score or more nations. Their feeling was not merely one of condolence with America in her loss, but of anguish in their own bereavement and of uncertainty for their future in the absence of the man to whom they had so greatly looked for a solution of the crucial problems of the world. 
Now, in addition to the political corruption within Harding's cabinet, the other thing that did irreparable harm to Harding's reputation um, was the fact that he had an affair, a long-term affair, with a woman 31 years his junior named Nan Britton. Uh, she conceived Harding's child in 1919. And one of the things as these events were coming to light, um, he wanted to make sure that Nan was not interviewed. So he sent her to the, uh, he sent her to the, uh, to a European trip. So on my own research, I found here the passenger manifest where three weeks after Harding's death that Nan returned to the United States. In 1927, she published a tell-all memoir called The President's Daughter. Uh, and it was widely divisive as to how people perceived this. Um, she was brought to court in a libel suit that she did not win in the 1930s because people felt that she was just attacking uh, the President of the United States. And the long-range solution to this is that uh, in 1995, the alleged daughter was proven through DNA matches to Warren G. Harding's descendants of his brothers that this indeed was Harding's love child. But going back to the way that his death was portrayed uh, at the time, you can see here the headline from our own Rutland Herald um, with the president dies suddenly of a stroke of apoplexy. His last words are addressed to his wife at his bedside. Uh, Calvin Coolidge immediately notified at Plymouth Not Vermont, Plymouth Not Vermont. And I would like to read to you what you can see here captioned within the box of the editorial from the Rutland Herald uh, on the death of Warren Gamaliel Harding. The nation, and in a measure the whole civilized world, is steeped in sorrow this morning as the news of President Harding's death becomes known. Dying suddenly and unexpectedly, when the best medical advice had already proclaimed his continued recovery, the tragic end of an illness which struck him down in the course of his duty comes to friend and foe, if he had a foe, with the stunning force of a personal bereavement. Warren G. Harding was more than a president. He was a man who appealed to men, who bound men to him by the power of a simple, manly character, who was the chief executive, not of any party or section, but of the whole nation. Skipping a paragraph, we mourn for Harding the man, we honor the memory of Harding, the president, yet in the midst of our sorrow, we must remember that now, as never before, the nation demands our utmost loyalty and our most patriotic service. And as we come to terms with what was truly going on in that last summer of Warren G. Harding's life, he wrote, uh, in this job, I am not worried about my enemies. It is my friends that are keeping me awake at night. And I would like to read to you, uh, going back more than 50 years, to quote a little bit from my well-loved presidential volume. Here is the assessment of an American heritage editor who wrote this. Warren Harding had been elected president because he had promised a resumption of our onward normal way. During his brief administration, however, a new norm emerged. Half of the American people lived in cities, cars were shrinking the country, and radios were bringing America's region still close together. Prohibition was ignored, which reduced respect for all laws. Jazz flourished 
and so did the Ku Klux Klan, Babe Ruth, movie stars, and gangsters were national heroes. In this America of flappers and jelly beans, of artists who called their generation lost, a return to normalcy was out of the question. Nothing could be returned to. Everything had changed. Thank you, and we will look forward to the rollout of the centennial of Calvin Coolidge inauguration.